You are listening to the Mark Guzman Podcast Experience. Before we get started, just a reminder that you can find all of my available rental properties on my website at markguzman.com. If you own investment property, click on the owner services section to see our complete list of services. Today's episode in tasting is sponsored by East Brother Beer. Located on Canal Boulevard in Point Richmond, East Brother Beer aims to provide the best beers brewed to create a classic style of beer with a touch of modern sensibility. Film is one of the best ways to tell a story. For Miranda Jonti, her upcoming film Grease Monkey tells a story that is not just personal to her but relatable to many others. She stars as Mara, a woman thrust into the male-dominated world of auto mechanics. This podcast is all about sharing the stories of people here in the Bay Area. And today we talk to Miranda about how Grease Monkey captures not just her story, but the story of women everywhere. Yeah, so it's interesting to see people's habits in, like, they want to do a podcasting, but to commit, and I tell people, just start off with one episode per week. Even if it's 20, 30 minutes, just do it. Once you get into that habit, it becomes much easier. So for me, when we decided, when I decided to do the podcast, I was busy managing about 300 units at the time. <laughs> and I was like, I don't have time to do the entire thing. So that's when I put an ad out. And that's when Sam and I ended up connecting. And he became uh, the producer of the show. How long have you been here, Sam? Uh, since the beginning. Oh, since uh, the very beginning. Yeah. yeah awesome. Since, uh, last July. Yeah. Yeah, and then it was something where, because in marketing, it's all about consistency, right? Yes. And so it's it was something where I'm like, I don't want to do one episode a day. I want to do, or I mean, one episode per week. I want to do something where we're doing two or three episodes per week to really get content out there. And so that's what we started to do. And so we've been doing that since day one, mm -hmm. about three episodes per week. For two weeks in November, December, we did one episode per per day oh my which was God. kind of fun to do yeah but that becomes very difficult because then you're dealing with a variety of guests scheduling and that is a whole different oh, yeah. thing in itself so now we're going to go back to posting something per day but it's going to be a little bit different in that we're going to still be recording three times per week mm -hmm. but then we're going to uh, because the podcasts tend to be 40 50 minutes long mm -hmm. or even an hour we can extract some of that audio and then use that audio for other days when we're not recording and posting. Great. Yeah. So basically recycling uh, the podcast that we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So that's... Are you still as in love with it as you were when you first started? Yeah, I've actually grown to like it way better. I Like... Doing the podcast was completely completely out of my element. It was something I was very nervous, uncomfortable with. It was something I was like, I, I think I just have to do it. Mm -hmm. Because you really psych out yourself when you, when you haven't done something like podcasting or film. You psych yourself out, especially going into the first time doing it, right? Mm -hmm. Once we had a few episodes in it became a lot more comfortable. So it's funny to go back to like episodes one through 10, listen to those episodes uh -huh. and then compare those episodes to the most recent episodes. There's a gradual improvement that happens over time. I'm sure. And the, the biggest benefit out of it is really that I've been able to take, once you get behind a mic, communication happens very differently than off a mic. And okay. you're able to then, and I think you become much better on a mic because you're putting a little bit more pressure on yourself. Mm -hmm. And that then translates to off the mic and better communication with clients. I bet you're right, yeah. So it's, it's very interesting how it's really progressed for me. So I really enjoy it. Um, it's a great hobby and it gr helps with the marketing. There's been people that have found my podcast and then found out that I was a realtor and then they hire me to sell their house or uh, manage their rental. And there it is. And there it is, yeah. That's so very cool. It works. And it's different. Not many people are doing podcasting these days. 
And in the real estate industry, very, very few people are doing it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's a big opportunity, especially the number of episodes. Each episode is another at bat. And that's why we want to put out as much content out there. I think it's really smart. Yeah. And it's fun. It is. It is. So did you try the beer yet? No, I was waiting for you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Cheers, Sam. So these are a sponsor, East Brother uh, Beer Company. They're out of Point Richmond. Have you ever been there to this spot? Have I been to Point Richmond or have I been to them? Um, East Brother. I have not. This is the first time I've heard about it, but... Well, you know where Point Richmond is, right? Yes, I do. My yeah. friend, um, Ray, has a shop there, Butch's Antiques and Collectibles. Okay. And they've got a little library there okay. as well. Yeah, Very I know cool. Point Richmond, but um, I've spent the summer trying local beers, and here's a new one. Yeah, they're hidden on Canal Boulevard. So there's, like, some office space, warehouses, and they're tucked in the very back of the end of the warehouse strip. Mm -hmm. But they have a great location. They've been adding different features, like ping pong tables pool tables darts they've got a cool bar they do parties they have food trucks that show up okay, and their I beer is go really now. good i've got to go yeah the one beer that i wish uh they could send us and uh i'm kind of hinting to rob and chris to send us the maybach beer that beer is so good that's got to be one of the that's got to be one of the best beers i've ever tried it's really really good so shout out to East Brother Beer for sponsoring the show. Um, so let's get started with uh, your episode here. And I'm excited for this. But the one thing I'd like to ask many of my guests is what has your attention right now? What's got your attention? It could be a movie, a book. It could be social media, anything. Um, I had the bright idea to do a fundraiser for Car Fire Animal Relief. I love animals, and a couple of years ago, I wrote a play called St. Francis about a Northern California woman who runs a no-kill shelter who's at war with the town. They want to kick her out and put in a Starbucks. And um, it did really well in New York. It got published. People loved it. And this coming Saturday is something called Clear the Shelters Day. Across the country, shelters uh, waive adoption fees, spay-neuter fees, uh, vaccination fees in an attempt to find every single animal within the shelter a home. Mm -hmm. And I thought, so this Saturday, August 18th. This Saturday, August 18th, it's across the country. Um, so if you want a dog, go to a shelter. And I thought, you know, with Grease Monkey coming up and this article just coming out, I want to capitalize on the growing interest of this. So why don't I do a reading and also do it for a cause so it's not completely self-serving, yeah. <laughs> which it totally is. Um, so right now what has my focus is putting on the staged reading in Berkeley and in Pinole this coming Sunday um, and getting an audience. So rewrites of my play. And we just had a brand new short film that I made with the guy who's directing Grease Monkey um, become available yesterday. You're very busy. I don't know what I would do with myself otherwise. <laughs> Drink a so, lot of beer. Drink a lot of beer. Drink yeah. a lot of beer. A lot yeah. of local beer. Isn't it funny when you find your passion and you're so consumed by it that the t even if things are going great, but the tiniest little break of gap in between, it you feel like you're lost, right? Completely at sea. Um, I came here for a job contract. I just finished as the uh, production manager for the Bay Area Playwrights Festival. I was in New York, and one of my plays was picked for the Capitol Fringe Fest in D.C., and another one was picked for the Last Frontier Theater Conference in Alaska, which is a really big deal. I'm like, are you sure? And then the opportunity to come and work in my hometown came along, and I thought, a summer in Pinole, I would be an idiot if I passed this up. And it's been balls to the wall, like 65 to 70-hour work weeks in the city, um, it's the hardest I've ever worked. And then it ended last week. And I thought, what? The f I can't do nothing. Most people would sleep and relax, but if I don't have anything to do, um, I feel very, very lost. I feel like I have mm -hmm. no purpose. It's absolutely terrifying. 
totally know that feeling. So I thought, let's do St. Francis. And while I'm doing it, I'm also thinking, what the fuck am I doing? What have I done? And I, it's on social media. I thought if I tell everyone about it, then I have to put my money where my mouth is. But also, what have I done? So, yeah, you feel lost. Now, your hometown's Pinole. You grew up here. I actually started off in Terra Hills. Okay. Um, well, what part of Terra Hills? Because there's a small section of Terra Hills that's Pinole. Terra Hills, Terra Hills. Okay. Like San you, Pablo. San Pablo, Terra Hills. Okay. Yeah, like down the street was Nations. Okay. Um, and what used to be Sprouse Ritz, which has not been there for a really long time. Like my mom and I would go there and get paper dolls, and there would be like a popcorn machine. It was like this fun little five and dime. Um, and then, you know, there's Montalvin. Um, now, oh. was that shop in the little strip center that was there? Yeah. 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 Um, God, it hasn't been there. Nothing's really been there in forever. Nothing's been there. I think that's just abandoned now. Completely, except for Nations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I grew up in I that think Nations can pop up anywhere and be successful. I think you're right. And I've never eaten there. Really? I know. At Nations or that specific location? Yes. At any Nations? Yes. Are you kidding me? I know. You're going to wow. take away my Pinole card? Well, you need to get to Nations right away. We should have had know. a Nations testing today and not a beer tasting. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> or both. Yeah, or both. Yeah, that is true. Episode sponsored by Nations and East Brother Beer. I like that <laughs> sound of it, right? Sold. Um, yeah, so I grew up on McMara Road and um, Stewart School in Pinole, Crespi Junior High, Pinole Valley High, Chico State, and then my parents moved to Pinole Valley. Mm -hmm. And that's when they got the four bedrooms in the pool. I know so many people from Pinole, San Pablo, that went to Chico State. How do you like it? I thought it was beautiful. Everyone said it's a total party school. Well, it's true if you're a partier. Mm -hmm. But if you're like a boring bookworm type, it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, but I loved it. I had my very first drink there. Uh, I gained a freshman 25 and discovered my love of theater. So how, how has Pinole changed for you? from when you grew up to today? Well, you see that big fucking eyesore down the road? <laughs> <laughs> that will now be the new Pinal Valley High? Yeah. Um, when I think of Pinal and my childhood, I think of walking from Stewart School, cutting through, you know, like walking down Sarah and cutting through the gate at the top of the hill behind Pinole Valley High and then walking to the library and and spending the library or the afternoon of the library until my mom picked us up. That's what I think of. Um, riding my bike. Um, you know, just very safe, by and large. Um, very relaxed. Um, very low-key. Um, I think of Pinole Valley Lanes which is still, mm -hmm. it will always be janky because it's a bowling alley. Yeah. Um, I think of the Red Onion. And and now you've got, you know, fucking five guys and Krispy Kreme and... At least tell me you've eaten that Red Onion, right? I love Red Onion. Yeah. I grew up eating Red Onion. Um, but, you know, like, I'll refuse to go to Krispy Kreme and I'll go to a la mode. Um, I won't go to Five Guys. I'll go to Red Onion. Um, you know, they have Five Guys. They have Habit Burger now. They have Habit, yep. I think there's like another burger joint I feel coming in. We don't need one. There's more. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so it's it's become more. <laughs> it's it's become more colonized. Um, I won't say gentrified because it's not, but it's um it's definitely busier. They've got more you know shoppy shops, and you know they've completely raised Pinal Valley High. So you know like this. You know, sweet little one-story, well, it wasn't sweet, but, you know, this one-story thing where you could go off campus for lunch, um, which didn't last that long, um, is now being replaced with what I am assured will be a big, beautiful high school, but now it just kind of looks like a prison castle high school. A prison castle? <laughs> it does. <laughs> um so for me, that's how it's changed. However, um, I have a big circle of people here who were friends in high school who are still here and who have made lives for themselves and who have, you know, really become part of the community. And I love that. I 
just hung out with my friend Jen Hansen the other day, who went to Pinal Valley High and now teaches French at De Anza, which I think is really cool. And um, and my friend Ray, who has the shop in Point Richmond, um, he just lives up on Alamo. Okay. Um, so in some ways it's changed, and in some ways it hasn't. And I'm closer with my high school friends now than I was then, because I think after a while you just kind of stop being an asshole and just like become an adult. <laughs> 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 At least I hope so. Yeah, that's interesting. Most people end up not st- staying friends with their high school friends. Everyone, you know, you grow up and lives happen and everyone splits apart. But it's interesting that you re- – do you always remain friends with people or do you reconnect? Both. I want to say the reconnecting happens in a way where, you know, you're maybe friendly with someone, um, but the connections have become deeper and stronger. And I was talking to my friend Piper about it from high school, who now lives in Martinez, Um and has just started a job as a teacher within her own school district. So I think that's a really nice full circle. Um, I, for me, what's happened is a desire to go back to my roots and to the people who knew me when I was, you know, 13, 14, 15, when I was, you know, becoming a person. So that's why that's happened for me. And I talked about it with Piper and she said, yeah, you want to go back. You want to go back home. So for me, it's about connecting with home, and a lot of these people for me are home. Now, do you grow up with a dog? No, because my parents wouldn't let me have one. <laughs> no. Because your Instagram bio says you moonlight as a dog lover. Oh, well, I will stop and talk to every single dog, um, or I throw myself at them. Um, the owners, whatever. Um, well, yeah, do you talk to the owner too or just the dog? The one thing I say to the owner is, can I say hi to your dog? Oh, yeah, and that's it. it and, yeah, fuck him. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, good. I'm the same. I, I don't want to talk to the person. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, let me make out with your dog. Yeah. <laughs> um, so everyone in my family not only has a dog, they have a rescue dog, which for me is really important. I mean, every single dog in the world needs a home, but stop fucking making them. Um, I would... There's too many careless dog owners, you know, and they just let dogs breathe left and right and or they, run on into the street. Or they say, hey, um, I'll sell you my brand new puppy for, you know, $1,000. Yeah, well, let's let's table that for now because it just makes me want to hit people. <laughs> um, I, I wrote a play about it. Um, so. This is uh, Judah the Shop Dog? Okay, so Judah the shop dog, um, she's this big, beautiful pit bull. And if you don't know her and you pull into the driveway, you've got this, you know, pit like running toward you with her ears cut off. And But she's just like a wiggle butt. She's a love. She just wants to sit in your lap. Um, I feel like pit bulls get so, such a bad rap. And that's really because of um, like a bad dog owner not raising the pit bull correctly. Ding, ding, ding. Um, yeah, I think they're the most misrep, they're one of the most misrepresented breeds and they really don't get a fair shake. Um, there are, there are breed specific bands all over the world. Um, they are loyal, they are smart. And one of the best things about them and the worst things about them is their loyalty to their owner. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, is it good or is it evil? Um, but they were originally used as nanny dogs. If you look up pictures, really? pit bull nanny dogs, yeah, they were used to guard the kids. Um, they're also known for their gentle nature, and yeah, so you're you're right. They're they get a really bad rap. Yeah. So so Judah the shop dog. So I'm making this movie, and I was location scouting. And one of the places we're going to use, and I know I'm jumping ahead, um, but it's all tied in, is Square Deal Garage. Um, I talked to Brandon Osmond, and he was just so great. And then the Wilkies, with whom I'm staying, said, well, you know, Mike is a high school friend, and he has a garage at his house. And I thought, just because you have a cappuccino maker doesn't mean that you can shoot, like, a coffee shop scene in your kitchen. (laughs) Um, Which is true. Um but very narrow. 
And they said, well, it's Kurt Pedracci in El Sobrani. So we were driving along Apian, and we went down the driveway, and it's just, it's like this beautiful oasis farmhouse and professional shop. And that's where Judah, the shop dog, lives. She's Kurt's dog. So I have photos of her sleeping in her dog bed, um, you know, behind a 55 Chevy. She just likes to be there next to Kurt as he works. And, um, you know, people were saying, well, we know you love dogs. Can you have dogs in your movie? And I said, no, that's not the world it is. This is about cars. And then I walked in and there's a dog and I thought, okay, I guess we're going to have dogs in it. Mm -hmm. Because people love people love it like when they walk into a hardware store and there's a shop dog i just went to um beer revolution in oakland not only are they dog friendly but there's wally the the bartender dog who just hangs out people love a mascot the bartender dog that's what i call him he's the dog of the bartender okay. but he hangs out and when people come in he'll jump up and put his paws on the counter and say hi to everyone <laughs> i have photos he's beautiful or he'll come out from behind and go and sniff everyone and make sure they're okay. So that's probably what it will be with Judah. Mm -hmm. Now, grease monkey. Yeah. Where's the term grease monkey come from? Now, The origin or how I came to use the name? Well, we'll talk about both, but let's talk about the origin. I mean, how did grease monkey come about for a mechanic? Well, it was, it was used as a term... Um, some people think it dates back to the 19th century. Um, some people say 1905 or Industrial Revolution. But it was a term used. Um, children would grease the axles of steam engines. That's what it was. They were the only ones who could fit. So they were like these little grease monkeys who did the work hmm. of the steam engines. Interesting. And, you know, basically mechanics are, you know, greasing axles and doing this. So it just kind of carried over and... Here we are. So how did you end up using the term for your film? I couldn't come up with a title for my fucking play. <laughs> I couldn't. I had so many bad titles. I had so many mediocre titles. And I was sitting across the table from my boyfriend at the time, like, as we were breaking up. And I said, I just can't come up with a title for this because that's really the most important thing. <laughs> and he was and still is... Um, a hobbyist of driving race cars, which is how I came up with the idea to have this woman work on cars. And he was a wonderful resource. And he just said, like, over drinks, as we were breaking up, what about Grease Monkey? And that was it. That was it. it, it no question. Very cool. Yeah. In a weird way. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So why don't you tell us a little synopsis of, now is this a play or is it a movie? It started as a play. Okay. Um, it had a run in New York City. And every single time I would have a first draft reading, second draft reading of it, up until the time that it had its run, people would say, you should turn this into a movie. How long was the run for? It was two weeks. It was, theater is so fucking expensive in New York, mm -hmm. like the rent. Um, and I thought, well, do I want to do it at a shitty theater for a month or at a really nice established theater for two weeks? Nice theater, because that's what I want people to walk into. This is the the celebration I want to give it. That sounded douchey. Um, it's what I want to do. But the cost of production of a play is so huge, right? The theater was... Is the theater really the biggest expense? Yes, because it was at Astor Place, which is downtown and right across the street from the public theater. It's expensive. It's the Lower East Side. Mm -hmm. um, it was thirty. Was it twenty six hundred? No, it was thirty two hundred dollars a week. Wow. So that's the theater. You have to do rental of space for rehearsal beforehand. Lighting designer, costumes, stage manager, scenic designer, director, actors transportation of all the stuff into the theater uh copying of scripts um postcards posters it it was incredibly expensive um but we raised the money we fundraised for over a year okay how do you fundraise it big borrow and steal uh we guest bartended 
one night for like two hours for the very first time and it was like wow we made six hundred dollars we held cabarets in midtown near times square and i invited all of my um, amazing singer friends to perform and i had my boyfriend at the time host it and you know we walked out with like nine hundred dollars so bit by bit, it began to add up. And I had T-shirts made that say Grease Monkey on it. And I sold them. I was going to sell them for 15 but someone said sell them for 20 So I did. Uh, we did fundraising campaigns. And then someone I know um, was saying, he was sitting with his wife. He said, well, how much does it cost you to do this? And I said, da, 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 da. And like a month later, I didn't realize he was gathering intel. He said... We'd like to help you. And he matched what we'd already raised. Wow. Again, it was, are you sure? And, you know, they came to see it opening night and the next night. And um, he's surprised me by showing up in the audience for St. Francis when it ran. And they've been really wonderfully encouraging, which is funny because they're roofers. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it was the last thing I expected. And it's really nice to have someone believing you because then you want to show them, I won't let you down. Yeah. Very interesting. So you had a two-week run. Mm -hmm. Now, what was Grease Monkey about? What's the story? Well, every play I write takes place in the Bay Area. Um, it's the story of a woman whose father has just died, and she inherits his vintage car restoration shop. She's been doing it since she was a kid. She's the best at it in the country. So she's got this vintage car shop. She's trying to figure out how to run a garage full of guys. And she secretly, now that she's all alone in the world, she also yearns for a family, but she thinks she can't have both. She thinks she has to choose because we, that's what we tell women. And then she finds herself in a love triangle with a younger man and her ex who comes back who says, I made a huge fucking mistake. So it's, it's a, about a woman who has to really admit what she wants. Um, and yeah. that journey to figure it out. And that journey to figure out. Um, the thing is, you know, usually in a love triangle, you have like the good guy and the bad guy. That's so predictable. It's so boring. I know so many really great guys in my life, like wonderful men who genuinely like women. Um, so they're both really decent guys. And I, want, I wanted it to be clear that just because this person isn't the right person for you doesn't mean they're a bad person. They're just not the right person. Um, so that was really important to me. And also, she's the jerk. She's the one who has to, you know, figure shit out and make mistakes and figure it out and finally take responsibility for the situations that she's in. Because mm. I think we also need to see people taking accountability because we don't see that especially today. It's very easy to put it on other people. It's the easiest thing in the world. I've done that. I probably did it earlier this week. Um, so we see someone who finally grows up. Um, and also who finally, when she does grow up, the prize is not the guy. The prize is her knowing what it is she finally wants. Knowing what it is uh, that she finally wants versus, you know, like in every single fairy tale, what's the prize? The prince. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. It's her knowing who she is. Hmm. That's very deep. But it's also really simple. Yeah. Um, she does end up with one of the guys, but it's only after she's decided... I'm happy by myself. So you had a two-week run mm -hmm. with the play. Mm -hmm. At what point do you decide let's turn this into a film? Honestly, <laughs> um, in December 2016, I remembered that the Puffin Grant Foundation was having its deadline come up. And I'd submitted before with Grease Monkey as a play, and I didn't get it. And I thought, well, I'm, I want to submit again. Oh, they're not doing theater this year, but they're doing, like, film and music. Fuck it. You know what? I'm going to submit it as a film. 
why not? So I can at least say that I submitted it. And six months later, I got a check in the mail saying, congratulations, you won the Puffin Grant. And I thought, oh my God. Oh, I guess now I have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. And um, as soon as I began to make that public, people jumped on board. I mean, it was like a tiny bit of money. It was like seed money for seed money mm -hmm. for seed money. Um, but we, you know, people said we were hoping you would do this. So we did like a 10 minute excerpt from it to see if it would work. And it really works. And I found this wonderful director. And um, the more people I talked to about it, especially here in Pinole, the eagerness and the support is overwhelming. So did you film it here in Pinole? We, the scene that we filmed, we filmed on the Lower East Side um, in Manhattan. But we will be filming here, Pinole, El Cerrito, El Sobrani, Berkeley, maybe something in San Francisco. But I very much want it to be um, East Bay centric because mm -hmm. it's my home. And the story is based here in San Francisco it's, or Bay Area. It's based in Berkeley. Um, there are so many shout outs to things like... Um, the Albatross, which is, you know, a bar on San Pablo Avenue. Um, Solano Avenue. Um, so there are, like, lots of little things that I've put in as, hey, guys. So, yeah, we'll be filming here. So what was the process for you in putting this, the original play together? Um, I didn't know that I knew how to write plays. I came home in 2008. I got the call. Hey, was that the first play you wrote? Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's it's done really well. Um, there were a couple of things that kicked off the ideas, and um, and I had a book called Bleeding Hearts Love Poems for the Nervous and Highly Strung. And I had had the idea in grad school to, and it's like poems, like erotic poems, lusty poems, fuck you poems. And I thought, wouldn't it be really cool to use these as like a monologue for someone talking about a relationship? And then I thought, no, no, make it a dialogue between him and her. And my grad school teacher at the time said, yeah, keep going with that. And then I dropped it. And then years later, I picked the book back up again and I just had an idea for the bar scene which is what we ended up filming. And what I what I did was I just I had a very clear idea about what's called a meet cute in a library in the stacks. Or I would think of one line and then I would build a scene around it. So I wrote all of these scenes by themselves and then I literally printed them out, put them on the table and went, "Okay, this goes here and this goes here. That's my favorite part, puzzle piecing." Okay. Finding out what the best way to tell the story is. And originally she was, oh God, a PhD candidate in feminist literature, which is, it was so boring. <laughs> it was so boring. And a friend of mine said, instead of having her talk about feminism, why don't you have her be it? I said, what do you mean? He said, put her in a man's role. I thought, that's a great idea. Okay, is she a firefighter? Is she a surgeon? Is she a this? Is she a that? And the race car guy, we were watching racing. Also kind of boring. <laughs> and I thought, oh, she restores race cars. But it still wasn't quite clicking. And then, um, what was it? Chasing, chasing classic cars was on like A&E. And it's about this guy who chases down classic cars. And I said, that's it. She restores vintage cars. And suddenly it was uh, a subject that I really wanted to research. And I learned all about cars, none of which I can tell you now. Because um, so that's how it became what it is. So when do you plan to start filming Grease Monkey? Spring 2019. Okay. Um, we're going to have the fundraising campaign starting at the end of August um, on Seed and Spark, which is a platform. I was telling Sam. Is that like Kickstarter? It's like Kickstarter. Okay. It, yeah, it's, um, it's a film 
fundraising platform. And I did my research. I thought, well, which is the best one, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or Seed and Spark? And by a landslide, it was Seed and Spark. It's the most successful film fundraising platform ever. And it's created by and run by women filmmakers. Is there a reason why you wouldn't want to do all of them? That's a really good question. Um, Because I feel like if instead of having one where you're trying to raise the entire amount, Mm -hmm. you would have a lot of mini ones and maybe split it up into various sections of the movie. I don't know. You know what? I didn't even think about that. I think I think there are going to be a couple of legs of it. Um, I think that a good portion of our money is going to come from private investors um, because we've got a couple of angles going for this movie. One of them, classic cars. People who are into classic cars tend to have deep pockets Mm -hmm. and also once the last time you saw a movie that took place in the world of vintage cars once the last time you saw a movie about a female mechanic who works on vintage cars yeah so i think it's something that it's like i want to see what i do on screen here's some money that's what i'm hoping happens i I think there would be a lot of classic car owners that would pay money to have their car in a movie Quite possibly. Quite possibly. Um, Kurt, the guy that I'm working with, has said, you can use all my cars. Here, why don't you drive this one? And again, are you sure? Um, And that didn't even occur to me, what you just said. People paying to have their cars in it. Sure, especially if they've worked on it. And especially if they know it's a small independent film and they could help in any way besides just donating their car for the movie. So do you want to help market my film? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, send us the link. We'll go ahead and uh, share it. I would love to. Yeah. So you're, so various locations that you want to film here in the Bay Area. You mentioned Solano Avenue, which is always – it's a great place to uh, definitely film. Uh, w- do you plan to film a few spots here in Pinole? I do. I do. I want to film at the Bear Claw. Um, I love Alamo Donuts so much so much i always get like two to four whenever i hit them the, i think it's really important to support mom and pop shops it's you've got to um but i want to film at the bear claw also because it's where i sit and do a lot of my work i was editing the saint francis script there this morning um i want to film at score deal which is right up the street mm-hmm. um that's been around for a long time too right 1919 I think 1919. Um, and the back roads of Pinole, like if you, not when you're going out Pinole Valley Road, but if you're going down Dam Road and then you take a right onto Castro Ranch. Is that what it is? Castro Ranch, I think. Okay. And yeah, Castro Ranch. Yeah, and then you're just, um, you know, you're winding through, you crest the hill and you start to go down and you can either go right to Martinez or left to Pinole. That little ride. It's just the hills of Pinole. It's one of my favorite things in the entire world. I like it at dusk. I like it in the morning. I like it in the afternoon when the sun's hitting it. Um, So those are the Pinole locations I can think of off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Now, what's been the most difficult part for you in script writing? Oh, well, see, here's the thing. And I saw this question. Someone said, you're going to have to learn how to do screenwriting because it's different. And I thought, it's not a skill I want to take the time to learn. Because once I learn how to do it, then I have to learn how to get good at it. Mm -hmm. And that's going to take a really long time. So I talked to my director, and he said, I would like to write the screenplay. And I said, I trust you with my life. Let's do that. So he's writing it. But what I'm learning about film, the difference in the two mediums is you can show so much more on camera um, in a storytelling way that you simply can't on stage. Um, Why is that? 
because you have a camera that moves and you have the whole wide world um, as your oyster. On stage, the confines of just using the stage both are restrictive and make you more imaginative, mm. which is the beauty of theater. So if I wanted everything to basically happen in the shop, the auto shop, or, or have it be the thing that's constantly like looming over her that she can't get away from, not that she wants to, I'm going to film everything in the shop. On stage, you can't really do that. You can't have the hotel scene take place in the shop. Um, so what our set designer did, and if we'd had more money, we would have had a truck on stage. Um, what our set designer did was had the immediate set be the shop. So you had this big desk. You had these big industrial shelves with things on it. Um, and then we moved them so the furniture that made up the shop became the library stacks. So everything came out of the shop to create something else. Hmm. Um, so in that way, the shop was always there. And I thought it was really, really cool. Um, so it's just, it's different. Okay. So writing the script, so you let your director write the screenplay then? Yes. However, he came here in late May, early June so that we could talk about the screenplay. And we talked about the relationships and he said, this we don't need to show. Okay. He said, but I would like to show more of this. So we need to create that. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of figuring out what about the script you want to highlight in film. Um, and like these long scenes of dialogue on stage, you can get rid of those and have like a three second shot of like a, a wordless exchange between two people that shows they're falling in love. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be okay with letting go of that dialogue. Yeah. So have you found yourself now doing more directing? No, no. Um, I, I have directed. Um, I'm not bad at it. But when it comes to my own work, I don't have distance. I don't have perspective. And there are people who are much better at it than I am who can say, hey, Miranda, did you know that you wrote this into your... Oh, my God, I had no idea. And I never would have seen it because, you know, you're right up against the glass. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I'm happy to turn it over to people with whom I speak the same language who can see the bigger picture because I can't. Mm -hmm. So that was your biggest challenge is really going from play to film or that that conversion. The, the biggest challenge right now, honestly, it, I'm going to say it's not an artistic thing. It's it's a logistics thing. It's it's such a boring answer. It's going to be. It's going to be the fundraising because I have no problem with the artistic stuff changing as long as we're on the same page. And he's someone I, I trust implicitly with my work because I know he gets it, which is great. But the funding is the most difficult part. Fuck my life, yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, we're looking at a 200K budget, which is small. Even if someone said, here's $5 million, we don't want a $5 million movie. We want a little indie film. Um, so that's the hardest part. Um, people are getting on board. People are interested. I've had um, actors contact me saying, hey, I saw this article in the paper. Are you casting yet? Um, and I'm not worried about so this So you have actors all. and actresses that reach out to you? And yeah. Yeah. Um, we have... We have um, I just finished the job as production manager. And a woman who is a dramaturg um, said, you know, I do film production here in the East Bay. I would love to help you. So people are coming forward and saying, how can I help? I can do this. Do you need this? Um, so that's not the hard part. And I would like to hire a female editor because I, I kind of got to put my money where my mouth is. If I'm, you know, shopping the female writer, female protagonist, you know, female star then I it's right great we're gonna have a female editor too mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think that that's the easy part. So what are some filmmakers or individuals that you draw inspiration from Greta for your films? Greta Gerwig. Greta Gerwig. She's a, she's a Sacramento girl. Um, and she did this wonderful movie called Lady Bird. I don't know if you saw it. No. It's basically a love letter to Sacramento. And um, she's been working her ass off for years doing independent films. And um, she just made this beautiful movie. And that made me really happy. Um, there's another one, Britt Marling, who works together with a guy. And she's been, you know, co-writing these films that she's starring in. He directs them. And they're, you know, female-driven stories. And they're fantastic, and they're edgy, and they're indie films. Um, and she plays people that aren't necessarily likable, but you root for them. And I like that. I like it when women, when people are not afraid to be ugly. Um, I think it makes them more root forable mm -hmm. um, because that's how people are in real life. Um, I think it's really cool that Patty Jenkins is directing Wonder Woman. I think that's great. It's a huge blockbuster. Like, oh, women can direct action films? It's like, dude, they've always been able to. You just were too fucking afraid to give them the reins. Yeah. For fear, not that they would be bad, but they would be as good or better. But as someone said, it's not pie. There's not going to be less. So what's going to be the overall message with this film that you want to get out to people? It's a couple of things. I think I want people to not be afraid to admit who they really are. Deep down, she's a family person. But she doesn't want to admit it for fear of being seen as weak or a slap in the face to her father's legacy. But she's someone who deeply wants a family. And, um, you know, how many people out there are just, you know, suppressing what it is they really want for fear of how they will be perceived mm -hmm. or for fear of people getting mad at them. So, you know, be honest about who you really are. Yeah, that's a very interesting psychological thing that humans do, right? We are our own worst enemy. And half the time, people don't fucking care. It's like when you go to the beach and you don't want to take your clothes off to be in your bikini or your board shorts or whatever because you think that everyone's going to be looking at you. One, no one cares. And two, the people that you see running around like they don't have a care in the world no matter what they look like, whenever I see them, I think they're having a lot more fun than I am. And God, they're attractive. No matter what they look like. So that's kind of it. So where do you see yourself in the future after Grease Monkey? <laughs> Drinking more beer, right? I've thought about that. Right now, it's my, it's my Olympus, as they say. When I think of what happens after Grease Monkey, I am filled with such dread and panic that I just don't think about it. Because what do you do when a project is over? What do you do when the biggest project you've ever attempted is done? I have no idea. Um, well, I have a feeling that you're going to get Grease Monkey done, completed. It'll be successful. Oh, let's get married. And then, <laughs> and then what's the next project? I think I want to make a movie out of St. Francis. Um, when we did this in New York, and again, it's about the world of dog rescue and adoption, people came up to me and said, I didn't know about the world of rescue. I didn't really know about how important it is to adopt dogs. And again, it's ding, ding, ding. So it's something I want to raise awareness about. And there are so many shelters and people who are behind this cause. Um, and again, this is, this is about a woman who is 
her intentions are good. She is on the side of moral right, but her execution is so fucking terrible that everyone has difficulty with her. So she's a very complex character. Um, I'd like to get the St. Francis movie made and um, and keep doing theater with one of my creative partners. I don't know what else comes next, but I do know that one of the best things in the world would be to premiere Grease Monkey in Berkeley. Uh, that would that would I think just be. I was just gonna say you have to bring it like to the Bay Area, Canole, Berkeley. It would. That would be the first time we would show it. Um, that to me would be. I think no matter how old you are. It's always, you know, when you come back from the big, big city and you're like, look what I made while I was away. Are you proud of me? That's kind of what it is. But it's also, it's my love letter to Fennel. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Hopefully it would lead to something else. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm excited for you. And Thank you. the film and everything that, I mean, you've got a lot of work ahead of you. That's for sure. Uh -huh. But... It, do you have the link already set up for people that can donate to we the movie? We do. Okay, so send that to me. I will. And then we'll go ahead and link it up. But where can people find it right now? You can go online. It's www.heyjonte.com. That's H-E-Y-J-O-N-T-E.com. It's my last name. And if you want to get my attention, you say, hey, Jonte, and I'll turn around. Perfect. So, Miranda, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Great episode. Good luck in everything. So the event that's this Saturday. Sunday. Now, or Sunday. Sunday. Okay, so that'll be the 19th. Is yeah. that correct? It's Sunday the 19th. It's going to be in Berkeley at the Starry Plow on Shattuck at 12 p.m., followed by the Pinnell Community Playhouse just down the street at 6 p.m. It's free. Um, there's some cursing. Heads up. Um, and all proceeds go to Car Fire Animal Relief. Awesome. How much... Well, it's free, oh, it's free so free. if you want to give us five bucks, awesome. If you want to give us 50, awesome. Okay. But if you just want to come and hear some theater and you like animals, that's great, too. Perfect. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hope you enjoyed the beer, and good luck to all your ventures. Thank you so much, Mark. It was a pleasure, and thanks, Sam. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lemon. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day -day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. Check out our sponsors, and I'll catch you on the next episode.